Good, you are here. Clario has made good on his promise. We are making ready to free your ship. I say still that you are fortunate. The ship was nearly lost, but it will float. For how long, I cannot say. You will wish to find a friendly port with some speed, I think. So you will go to the great Kahanga city as well. You must sail north for some time, and then a little east. Take care in Nekitaka, outsider. It will close its jaws around you, and you will never notice. Come, we will see your defiant out to sea. We should address the matter of our ship's resources before we get underway. It saddens me to inform you that we lost several crew and most of our provisions during the storm. However, Port Marge appears to be well supplied, and I expect the recent disaster has left several sailors in want of a ship. I suggest we contract for additional supplies and crew before we return to open water, or our voyage may indeed be a short one.
Cardinal. On behalf of the Principe and Patrina, I must request we meet in Parley. Agrasim. I will make this quick. I have heard some marvelous tales regarding your ventures in the Deerwood. In fact, you are the first dragon slayer I have ever met, outside of a grave. Some fools would seek to make a fortune by pilfering from one such as you. I take it he is not one of those fools. Perhaps we should listen. I believe you have met such a fool, Captain Benweth of the Drake. This is the first you are hearing of us, truly? We are a magnificent, but largely landless people, so we have come to own the sea. To survive, we must seize prosperity where we can. Hence, we are oft labeled as pirates, smugglers, merchants of illicit trade, or mercenaries. It will not always be so, but it is for now. Gelarde, then that should make this easy. I am keen to show my rascal of a compatriot some much needed humility. I thought perhaps you may care to as well. For our teas, for do more job for me, friend. Hope you don't die in the effort. Benweth is no captain of mine, Aimiko. It is not beneath my flag his Drake sails. Yet I do seek to temper his actions when they would endanger the Principe altogether.
Are you saying if we rile you, you will pose no threat to us? Echo <laughs> see. Pardon if I do not believe you, Dragon Slayer. Word of Menweth's raid on the Defiant will spread throughout the Deadfire. More fools will seek to prey upon you. I would suggest you stave off all others by making an example of Menweth. Benwet's Drake took damage during the storm. Eventually, he will need to dock for repairs, and when he does, Serefet can find him for you. He is rather an unrefined creature, but he is a most skilled ship hunter, I assure you. Unrefined? Begging your pardon, Captain, but I'd be the eye fucking model of the gentleman of fortune. <laughs> as for Benwith, that sucker has squigged its be as predictable as the tide. I'd wager all my furriest beats that he'd set sail for deadlight. That would be felicitous indeed, as I believe the traitor Remaro hides there as well. I quite enjoy killing two men with a single bullet. Wouldn't have even thought of it if you hadn't brought it up, sir. Now, I ain't hardly in any hurry to leave the fine company of the gentlemen of leisure, but the captain be right about me finding your mark. Adding to that, you sail into Fort Deadlight not knowing your innies from your outies, you might very well find the locals cannon-fucking your boat to sudden splinters. What venture does not require an investment to be prosperous? The Seraphim is an allowance which I expect you will return, in one payment or another. Oh, you won't be regretting this, Watcher. At least so long as you keep us heavy in grog and light on the onions. Ugh, them dirty shit apples ain't never agreed with me, and I'll be suspecting they never will. He's not sleeping near my berth, I promise you that much. I sail now for Dunwich, my own safe port. I will await you there, should you be successful in schooling our wayward captain.
Yes? Thank you again for maintaining my story in front of Vanessa and the others. I didn't enjoy deceiving them, but it seemed simpler than the alternative. There could be nothing between us. But it was nice to have a friend all the same. After we parted, I set out to destroy the Leaden Key. It's controlled us for too long. I wanted to free Kith from it. So for five years, I've been tracking down Leaden Key circles, searching for the places where they operate in secret. Trying to undo them. The task has been more difficult than I anticipated. I don't think I fully understood the weight of the decisions I would have to make. All the burden of living with them. It was much easier when I only had to follow someone else's lead. My father's, Theos's, yours. I know, and I have. After we defeated Theos, I thought the hard part of undoing his work would be tracking down the Leaden Key's members and operations. Perhaps this would be easier with an example. I went to a village in Old Avalia, a run-down backwater river place. Aye, right home like it was. Uh, centuries ago, the Leaden Key had intervened to end some heretical cult. The details were lost, but what had endured was a practice of ritual bloodletting, a gruesome, pointless tradition. You got an eye for charming little towns, I'll say that much. At every full moon, the villagers would feed the soil with their blood. No one, young or old, sick or hale, was exempt. The village priest administered the practice. Grim old fellow. Reminded me of Theos. Wicked El Bonbach. Tis what the lad means. He was a tyrant. I was certain that if the villagers were free of his influence, they'd be free from the bloodletting too. So I arranged for him to have an accident. The old man died, and the villagers were terrified. They were convinced his death was an ill omen. They blamed it and every other mishap that befell them on their lack of faith. So they began bloodletting every week, turning on their neighbors for giving too little. 
Instead of a handful dying each year, a few perished every week. to do something, didn't I? I keep wondering what I might have done differently, or how I could have known better. I suppose so. Thank you. It's a relief to share this burden. You've given me a lot to think about. Ah, that. I'm looking for an old leaden key sect. I've found several references, but... I want to be sure. Uh, please, let me go over my notes again. Then I promise I'll tell you everything. You know me too well. All the same, I need to gather my thoughts. How may I help? Yes? One would hardly imagine that a colossus made of glowing Ardra could be so hard to find. But then I suppose the gods wouldn't have chosen you if the task were easy. Well, they seem largely competent. I would feel better about that were they not run by profiteers and animances. Well, Governor Clario seemed honest and well-intentioned. So one wonders why he was stationed at such an out-of-the-way post. I'd heard Deadfire had a pirate problem, but I had no idea how large it was. Or how fashionable. Still, the only thing more dangerous than a unified pirate nation is one at war with itself. I worry about who will be caught in their crossfire. As a matter of fact, I did. I saw my mother for the first time in years. She was well. She'd been living with her thane for quite some time. I don't think she'd been to see my father since I left. I used to blame her for her long absences, for not intervening directly with my father. I realized that she was torn between two demanding roles and two demanding men. I used to resent her for failing to protect me, but I understand now that her absence is what allowed me to grow. Intentionally or not, she gave me the space I needed to learn a degree of independence. Thank you. It felt good to resolve that much. It's one thing to forgive my mother for her absence. Quite another to excuse him. It was. It's been a while since I've been able to speak candidly with anyone. Especially about the Leaden Key. It's unexpectedly liberating. As a matter of fact, I did. I saw my mother for the first time in years. It was. As a matter of... I saw my... My father was steward to an Earl in the Seathwood. 
My mother entered into a hamnig with a thane when I was very young. I think they must have loved each other once, but I recall little evidence of it. It was. Give her a bad rap. The High Captain. Truth be told, Ferrante half expects us to get our asses blown out of the water at Fort Deadlight. Fortunately for you, I have this bad habit of beating the odds. Of course, I do that by way of good old traditional chicanery. And the most important part of any Orn swoggle? Solid planning. Well, uh, that and surviving. Valian made originally. Piled them stones up a few centuries back, but gave it up when the fishmen wouldn't leave them be. Hard to defend against Wilder crawling up out of your crappers. Captain Aldees claimed it a few years back. Fucking filthy from bow to stern. She had her lads and lasses cleaning fish shit out of the floorboards for months. A couple of them thought he might be better sailing elsewhere and left in the night. Aldi's tracked them down quick as you like, took their heads, and fixed them into little lanterns for the front gate. Called them Fort Deadlights Deadlights. They say she ain't had a deserter since. Ah, tad cruel for my taste. But I admit to admiring the wordplay. Funny thing about it being a fort means it ain't a boat. Means I don't have to worry about the way the cannons are storing onkin' big balls. Guns they got crowned in that castle put a hole in your poop deck before you've sighted land. Fort itself be floored to sealing rum sodden fools, so that be going for us. But Aldis keeps the crew on the walls sharp and sober. One blast of their horns and deadlights locked up tight as an adir and mugger night. We'll stay that way too, till any unfamiliar ships have been shot to shit and shot again. Yeah, she's sharp as shit, that one. Tongue, mind, and ears alike. Sail that a deer would or a deer one. Knows her not, and how to crew a ship that won't turn sour. But words ring out among the Principe. More than you'd think for new blood. Part of that's a fierce support of freedom, from slavers, from the empires. From the Juana's caste system, even. The rest are lenient and. Step out of line, and Ferrante's got your old crew up for lashes. Out this, though, she's, uh. Now, let's say there's a reason she attracts limp cocked nut twists like Benwith. Can't say I much approve of a lack of regard for our traditions, but, uh. Can't say I don't share a vexations with Ferrante in the old garden, either. Ah, the Principe's no fleet. More a mishmash of fiercely independent captains. A lot of them take to one another like sharks to krakens. But we be bound by the slippery slipknots of tradition. Even those buck in tradition cooperate for protection against our enemies. Many of the old guard have died off, though, and the new blood flooding in be uh, less the civil sort. Oh, I did say contacts, didn't I? Contact would be more accurate. 
in the singular. A lass by the name of Siri. Been running the same circles for years, doldrums and fair winds. We're never family, but uh, never on the wrong ends of arms, neither. Might have uh, shaken the sheets a few months back. Are you saying your helpful contact is actually your ex-lover? Regardless of how she feels about me, there's no love lost betwixt her and Benwith, that's for damn certain. Ugh, random? What do you take me for, Captain? Oh, mighty kind of you, Captain, given how useful I look. Deadlight's a tough coconut to crack, but if not cracking, what are nuts for? Smart play for crashing any party involves scavenging yourself up an invite and then dressing to impress. My captain, from stem to stern. Looking the part in this case means hoisting colours identifying us as Principe. Don't have to tell you how dangerous such a bit of fabric can be if the wrong person catches you flying it. Well, Principe captains don't just give up their flags for a few coins. Nakitaka's black market. If there be a Principe flag for sale, it'll be there. Mark it up and relocate every so often to avoid the Royal Guard. We'll just have to find wherever it currently be anchored. Captain, looking forward to watching you work. Mm -hmm. All right. Not to be telling you your business, Cap, but if we don't set sail for deadlight, Ben Wef will finish his repairs at Paul Anchor. Valid made originally. Captain Aldi's claimed it a few years. A couple of them they say she ain't had a deserter since. Uh, tad cruel for my later. Hey. Hey, look who it is. What can I do you for? Well, hey. Tell me what's on your mind. They're there in my head when I sleep. And sometimes I can taste them on the back. It's time I got... Sure. Still kicking, eh? What'll it be? There's plenty of people looking for passage out of here. Let's see if any of them catch your interest.
Still kicking, eh? What'll it be? Have a look. Still kicking, eh? What'll it be? Folks come by here all the... Still kicking, eh? What'll it be? Folks come by... Still kicking, eh? What folks come by? Still kicking, eh? What folks come by? Still kicking, eh? What'll it be? Folks come by. Still kicking, eh? What'll it be? Folks come by. Still kicking, eh? What'll it be? Folks come by here all the Still kicking, eh? What'll it be? There's plenty of people looking for passage up. Still kicking, eh? Folks, come by.
the ring of a bell comes to you on a cold wind. The ring comes again and again, until soon the air is full with the sound of a thousand, thousand bells ringing all at once. You are alone. And then, you are not. Indistinct figure stands before you, flickering between forms like a fire cast shadow, a fixed, taunting grin, bottomless black eyes, a yawning chasm in the earth, the aspects of Barith, the usher, and the pallid knight shift in and out of focus. And at their back, four indistinct shades hover. You feel an eternity stretch out behind each of them, reaching back to places so distant and yet so near you cannot comprehend their size. The shifting image of Barith settles on the aspect of the pallid night. Watcher. Her voice is the discordant clangor of gongs struck out of time. I tasked you to discover Aethys' intentions. Tell me what you have learned. The pallid knight knits her brows. He does not seek to return to the beyond? Intriguing. Her sickly pale skin pulls tight across the bones of her face, as if the shell of this aspect does not quite fit the impossible creature it contains. The figure nearest Barith dissolves and reforms in the image of a thin-lipped ancient crone whose face has felt the melting kiss of fire. The goddess Wodica strides forward. Does Aethys frighten you, Barath? He should. Magran subdued Aethys' influence once before, and yet he returned. From out of Wodica's shadow shuffles a hunched, bald man you recognize as the god Scan. His skin is mapped with swollen lash scars, and breath whistles through the ragged hole in his face where his nose once was. He does not speak, but stares up at Wodica with naked loathing plain on his ruined face. Wodica steeples her long, knob-jointed fingers. We must annihilate Aethys now before he makes a rash decision we cannot easily annul. She casts a sly look at the pallid knight from the corners of her eyes. A moon would do the job nicely. Wodica stares at you down her long nose. I would destroy it all in the blink of your wide eye if I believed it would benefit me. Empires can be rebuilt. Souls can be reforged. Do not forget it. The figure beside the aspect of Barith flows forward in a swirling cloud of ash. The ash falls to the tiles and reveals a molten-skinned woman leaning on a monstrous, wicked-edged broadsword. Magrin's glowing lips curl in disdain. We must find a solution to the problem of Aethys that is neither do nothing nor destroy the world. I acted in haste during the Saints' War. You will not goad me into doing the same now. 
To move against him while his plans are unknown would be the height of foolishness. We must find wisdom in precaution. Margrin looks at you as one might a wayward gob of spit on one's shoe. It is no business of yours what the gods decide. Another of the silent figures steps forward, and the warm, golden light of a summer's afternoon spills across your face. Let's all take a deep, calming breath. Perhaps cooler heads will prevail. Behind Helia's words, you hear the soft coo of doves. Aethys has been separated from us for too long. Isn't it possible he intends only to gather enough souls to reclaim his realm in the beyond? He should be welcomed. You look up then into avian eyes. Through them, you see clouds of starlings converge and divide. Helia puts a feathered hand to her chest. He wouldn't. Betrayal is not in his nature. Scan shuffles forward. Yes, yes. We should welcome Aethys' return to the fold. His gratitude we can leverage to cajole him into divulging his plot. Then, when he believes himself to be in our good graces, we do as Wetica suggests and crush him into the earth. Scan licks the ragged edge of his lipless mouth and grins, then turns to Helia. I did not expect such a deliciously ruthless idea from you, Helia. I am impressed. Helia's feathered crest stands on end. You, you wretched little creature. Your point is well made, little watcher. If self-evident, Aethys has not been known to possess a vindictive nature. Indeed, he has occasionally been magnanimous to a fault. However, if we push him to the brink of reason, there is no telling what he may do. He is, as ever, unpredictable. Something akin to fondness creeps into her voice. The pallid knight gestures for silence. Aethys cannot be killed, but he may be subdued. Yet to do so will take immense power and time. Both stand in his favor. Mogren grits her black glass teeth. That is why we must ascertain his plans before he has the chance to put them into motion. She begins to pace. Her steps leave little trails of fire in her wake. Mogren stops and balls her hands into flaming fists. Even if we manage to destroy his current form, there is the possibility he could return if he has not already absorbed all of his children. The pallid knight casts a cold, cutting glare in Mogren's direction. Mogren speaks too freely. That knowledge is beyond your ken, Watcher. Mordica waves the gods to silence. Aethys gathers strength. His strength is a threat to us. Her voice takes on a sharp, almost panicked edge. There is no sensible answer to the question of a resurgent Aethys other than decisive final action. Your opinion is unasked for and unnecessary, but noted nonetheless. Though her tone is impassive, the banked fury in her eyes says well enough what she thinks of your interruptions. 
We will act when it is appropriate to do so, and not before. The Pallid Knight steps away from the half-circle of assembled gods. She pulls herself up to a great height. But the words she speaks next come not from her mouth, but from all around you. Follow him, Watcher. The black of the Pallid Knight's irises expand until her eyes are as dark and cold as the void between stars. She bends down and brings her ghostly face level with your own. Your debt to me remains unpaid. She stares at you, unblinking. Like a needle drawn to a magnet, you are pulled toward her one compulsory step at a time. You blink open your eyes and find yourself on the floor of your ship's cabin, alone. I've got it. Shiplaf sure is an adventure, ain't it? Just think of all the places we can sail to, all the sats we could see. This is nothing like being stuck on a farm, or cloistered in the back of a temple. Tell me what's on your mind. They're there in my- and sometimes... I can sure thing, Watcher. Yes? 
I got time. Not to be telling you your business, Cap, but if we don't set sail for deadlight, Ben Wef will fin- Later, sure, sure. No hurry here to, uh, ship off back to the gentlemen of leisure. Agracima, Casita, for taking me on. Complicated. Take them down. 
Strain. Take them down. Oh, come on. That would be enough. 